Hello, and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, From Cuba with Love, Juan René Betancourt. The Crisis was, as you may recall, the official magazine of the NAACP, first created by W.E.B. Du Bois and edited by that luminary from 1910 to 1933. A later editor named James W. Ivey, who ran the crisis from 1950 to 1966, once reflected on his priorities in choosing the journal's content by saying, Because I believe that American Negroes should recognize similarities between their problems and those of the blacks in other parts of the world, especially throughout the Americas, I published a number of articles on black-white tension in Cuba, Brazil, Martinique, and the then-British West Indies. Given Du Bois' pan-Africanist commitments, we can be confident that he would have approved. In fact, since he was still alive at the time, we might even imagine that the editorial approach of Ivy was growing on Du Bois as he read a piece in the May 1961 issue of The Crisis. Its title was Castro and the Cuban Negro, and its author was Juan René Betancourt. Then again, Betancourt's article is harshly critical of communists, especially in Cuba, but also in the world as a whole, and that might have bothered Du Bois if he did read the piece. In October of 1961, he left the United States to go live in Ghana, but Shortly before doing so, he made a rather clear statement of his political stance by formally joining the Communist Party of the USA. Would Du Bois have dismissed the article's anti-communist message as a sad case of reactionary capitalist nonsense? Or would he have taken a more nuanced view of what Betancourt had to say, despite their definite divergence in political orientation? We will return to this question later, after we've made a case for the bold proposition that Betancourt's role in the history of Cuban thought was not unlike that of Du Bois in the United States. We say this even while admitting that Betancourt is much less well-known, not just in the wider world, but even in Cuba itself. He was a black thinker and activist, born in the city of Camagüey in 1918. He trained as a lawyer, but his passion was writing and organizing on behalf of his fellow Afro-Cubans. He published his first book, A Brief Examination of the Nature of Racial Prejudice, in 1943. He authored a number of other works, but none more fascinating than El Negro, Ciudadano del Futuro, meaning the Negro Citizen of the Future. It was published in 1959, the same year as the triumph of the revolution that brought Fidel Castro to power. While Betancourt would eventually cast Castro as a villain in his piece in The Crisis, back in 1959, he received an official post from Castro as leader of the National Federation of Black Societies. He was, therefore, at the time that he published El Negro, cautiously optimistic about what might be accomplished in the wake of Castro's revolution. If we are to understand Betancourt's thought during that remarkable time, it is important to connect it to the larger context of the history of Black political thought in Cuba. Betancourt himself would want us to go back at least as far as José Antonio Aponte, a free Black man credited with inspiring a series of slave rebellions in Cuba in 1812. Continuing a theme from part two of our series of podcasts, Aponte apparently attracted people into his conspiracy to rebel by talking to them about the Haitian Revolution. He carried around a book of paintings that included depictions of Toussaint Louverture, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, and Henri Christophe. In a chapter of El Negro devoted to Aponte, Betancourt draws special attention to the fact that this was a free man who had been relatively comfortable on account of his work as a carpenter. He therefore represents, in Betancourt's view, a shining example of dedication to black unity in the face of oppression. Another figure discussed at length in El Negro is Juan Gualberto Gomez, who came to prominence during the revolutionary wars that Cuba fought to win independence from Spain during the latter half of the 19th century. According to one scholar, Gomez was the ideological leader of black Cubans from the 1880s until his death in 1933. In this capacity as a leader of thought, he held aloft the fervid goal of complete assimilation and the development of a national identity that transcends race. For Gomez, the ultimate purpose of Black efforts should be to realize a Cuba in which all are equally and simply recognized as Cubans. In El Negro, Betancourt is sharply critical of Gomez for his treatment of the pursuit of Cuban freedom and sovereignty 
as the path towards the end of racial discrimination. In Betancourt's eyes, Gomez wastefully encouraged black humans to sacrifice on behalf of a nation that did not in turn reward them with any real progress towards racial equality. By contrast, Betancourt passionately sings the praises of Evaristo Estenos, who led the short-lived Independent Party of Color, or PIC, as it was called by its Spanish initials. Estenos and others involved in founding the party fought valiantly for Cuba's independence. By choosing in 1908 to form a party that would defend the interests of black people, they voiced their discontent with the continuing forms of systematic racism experienced on the island. Ironically, they encountered suppression in 1910 in the form of an amendment to an electoral law by Cuba's first black senator, who was at the time of the amendment also the first black president of the Senate. Martin Morua Delgado held so extreme a commitment to full integration and assimilation that the Morua Amendment, as it was called, outlawed any political party based on racial identity. Morua Delgado died the same year that this law was passed, and thus he did not witness its ultimate terrible outcome, the so-called Race War of 1912, during which the Cuban army responded to armed demonstrations by the PIC by massacring not only its leadership, including Estenos, but also thousands of innocent black civilians. Where Estenos represents the best of leadership for Betancourt, Morua Delgado exemplifies the awful and dangerous treachery to be expected from bad leaders. Betancourt reflects on this topic at a more abstract level in El Negro by distinguishing between black leaders and leaders of black people. He says of black leaders, any man of color that is succeeding or has succeeded in any sphere of activity from sports to science, from war to fine arts, is an outstanding man, a winner, who given the fact of being black and of having awakened sympathy and new hopes among his brothers with his successes, we can also call a leader. Despite his sharp disagreements with their views, Betancourt is willing to count both Gomez and the treacherous Morua Delgado as good examples of black leaders. This category must be kept separate, he argues, from another kind of person, one who devotes the very best that is within him to the specific task of the advancement of his race, keeping that among his activities as the question above all other questions, subordinate to no other question. For this type of person, says Betancourt, we have reserved the title of leader of black people. There have been many black leaders in Cuban history, but leaders of black people? According to Betancourt, that have been only two, Aponte and Estenos. It is evident throughout the book that Betancourt is trying to position himself as a third. After all, starting early in adulthood, Betancourt was active in leadership roles in black organizations. In 1940, he became the Secretary of Culture for the Provincial Federation of Black Societies of Camagüey. Black societies had long played a central role in Cuban history. During the time of slavery, they emerged as mutual aid societies that were also differentiated in membership by place of origin in Africa, which meant that they offered a way to preserve cultural identity. By the 20th century, they were no longer tied to ethnic difference and had evolved in other ways too. But in the wake of the suppression of the PIC, these societies provided a remaining vehicle for black self-organization and socio-political action. By 1938, the National Federation of Black Societies was born, allowing for a structure in which local societies and the provincial federations of these local societies, like the one for Camagüey, could act collectively on the national stage. Prior to his appointment by Castro to the post of Secretary General of the National Federation in 1959, Fettencourt's greatest effort at becoming a true leader of Black people was his creation in 1954 of the National Organization for Economic Rehabilitation, or the ONRE, according to its Spanish initials. A year later, he published his most important book before El Negro, it was called Doctrina Negra, or Black Doctrine, and was his first attempt to express the ideas motivating the ONRE. Some of the chapters in El Negro include long quotations of this previous book. Doctrina Negra was, however, superseded by El Negro, which has in its front matter a page that features the ONRE logo and advises the reader that the present work was unanimously approved by the regional cell, that is, the Executive Council, of the National Organization for Economic Rehabilitation as the philosophy and living doctrine that orients and inspires its movement. To guide black Cubans along the path of liberation was therefore the express purpose of El Negro, something embodied by the book's unique structure. It is divided into two parts, the first of which consists of short essays that are labeled either 
charlas, that is talks or lectures, or temas, that is thematic explorations. The second part builds on the first by presenting the reader with 17 sets of tareas, that is homework. Each tarea consists of a number of questions along with their answers capped with a problem, that is a short depiction of a disagreement between two imaginary characters about the subject matter addressed by the questions. The reader is asked to determine which of the characters is right, and as with the questions that precede them, the Tancourt provides the correct answer and an explanation of why it is correct. This feature of the book comes in handy for our discussion, as we will select a few of the questions and answers in order to help us summarize the major ideas defended by Betancourt in the essays of the book's first part. The first tarea begins with two questions concerning the definitions of racial prejudice and racial discrimination, respectively. Betancourt defines racial prejudice as the absurd belief that a man can be superior or inferior to another because of the color of his skin, and racial discrimination as any kind of attack motivated by this kind of difference. This contrast between prejudice and discrimination is important for Betancourt's understanding of the nature and history of racism. The third question in the homework is, between racial prejudice and discrimination, which came before the other? The answer is prejudice, because discrimination is simply prejudice translated into action. This is arguably rather uncontroversial, but Betancourt's distinction leads to a striking implication, which is expressed in the book's first chapter, Discrimination Against Black People. Here he claims that, while the black man was a slave, there was racial prejudice, but no racial discrimination. The reason for this is that, as there was no possibility of competing with owners, there was no occasion for being discriminated against. Betancourt would therefore have us understand racial prejudice as an emotional phenomenon, initially cultivated by slavery, that was then translated into effective action only when there came to be a discrepancy between this feeling of disdain and the new legal status of black people. This same set of homework also features questions that help us understand what Betancourt takes a class to be. He defines this term by invoking the concept of common pain, meaning that which is suffered by all who share the same category, race, or origin. Thus, the question, what is a class, is answered as follows. We call the group of people who, for whatever reason, suffer any common pain a class. A later question draws out the relevant implication for his main subject, do black people constitute a class in Cuba? The answer, yes, they constitute a class because all suffer the common pain of racial discrimination. You might be even more surprised by this than by his claim that there was no discrimination during slavery, as we don't usually think of racial groups as classes. And if you were a mid-century communist, you'd be more than surprised, you'd be appalled. This application of the notion of class puts Betancourt onto a collision course with the communists. Neither black people nor any racial group can count as a class, according to traditional Marxist thought, especially because it is possible to find black people playing various roles in the production of goods, thus making it obvious that black people belong to multiple classes. Why then would Betancourt use the word class in this way, given that the Marxist use of the term is so long and well established? Perhaps in part to appropriate the pre-existing power and influence of Marxist ideas and language, especially as he shares with Marxists the belief that economic factors must be seen as fundamental when trying to understand racial discrimination. In any case, the error that must be addressed in order for black people in Cuba to be truly free, according to Betancourt, is the failure to organize on the basis of this class position, that is, the failure to organize black people as black people. He strongly condemns in one of the book's essays the kind of black Cuban activist who, has been ready to fight and has fought as a Cuban, as a worker, as a politician, or even as a peasant, who has only not been ready to fight as a black person, which is precisely the point of view from which he is mistreated in each and every one of the other spheres. So black people must organize as black people in order to fight back against the various attacks they experience as victims of racial discrimination. Since Betancourt takes the root of the problem of racial discrimination to be economic, he proposes an economic solution. In the eighth homework set, the question is posed, how will the organization, that is the ONRE, act in order to succeed? The answer is that it will act through action and omission. 
It will be acting through action by creating sources of work by means of which black and white people may earn a living. It will be acting by omission when refusing to purchase the products of businesses that do not employ black people. In an essay entitled Doctrine, Betancourt explains that the organized effort of a boycott by black Cubans will be powerful because it can reduce a company's sales by a hefty 33%, this based on the estimate that black Cubans constitute about a third of the population. To the homework question, what is the fundamental principle of our movement? Betancourt answers, numerical force translates into economic force. The scholar Lawrence Glasgow has argued that if we compare Betancourt to the past leaders, Gomez and Estenos, he stands out as the most racially conscious of the three and the closest to being a black nationalist. Close, but no Cuban cigar, or so Glasgow argues. For even when speaking of black people organizing themselves in order to create work opportunities, Betancourt speaks of offering employment to white people as well. He seems to have offered the most extreme version of black consciousness among Cuban intellectuals, but still fell short of a truly separatist black nationalism. For Glasgow, this shows just how unhospitable the social structure of Cuba is to that political orientation. Perhaps, but what stands out to us is the nuanced way that Betancourt's position combined separatist and integrationist elements. He demanded black self-organization, a program of self-conscious and mutually recognized commitment among Black people to meeting their own needs and exercising their collective power. He was hostile to projects of assimilation and integration as traditionally understood in Cuba. And yet, in the homework, he answers the question, is our movement separatist, by writing, exactly the opposite. Our movement is the only road that leads to true national integration. The weight of the history of slavery as embodied and incarnated in racial prejudice and discrimination obstructs Cubans from living and flourishing together. Betancourt holds that his plan, which requires self-reliance and self-actualization from Black Cubans in addition to whatever goodwill and support may come from non-Black Cubans, is the only plan capable of overcoming the heritage of slavery and making the way clear for a Cuba characterized by freedom and equality. This explains the book's secondary title. O todos somos felices, o nadie podrá ser feliz, meaning either we will all be happy or nobody will be able to be happy. Happiness is a heavily recurring theme in the book. When calling for and justifying black organization and collective struggle, Betancourt almost always speaks of this in terms of the pursuit of happiness. As a concept, happiness is clearly at the heart of Betancourt's philosophy. He strove to be not just a thoughtful political actor, but a political philosopher in the fullest sense of the term. Nowhere is his aspiration to recognition as a philosopher more on display than in the book's introduction, in which words like race and blackness do not come up at all. Betancourt instead links happiness to notions of God, goodness, evil, and duty, citing Plato and invoking the Stoics. He indicates the political nature of his text only in the introduction's final sentence. Having earlier compared God to the Caesars at the circus in ancient Rome, who let loose beasts, but also armed the gladiators facing these beasts, Betancourt writes, We are no more and no less than the classic gladiator with his sharpened dagger before the hungry and aggressive beast of social injustice. In keeping with this broad perspective, the essays of El Negro explore a variety of philosophical themes. A chapter on physical beauty makes the argument that distaste for black physical characteristics will be overcome through the invigorating power of self-organizing. A chapter on religion touches on basic questions about the existence of God and the significance of religious diversity before ending in a valorization of the syncretic religion famously developed by Afro-Cubans, with connections to traditional African religions and above all, Yoruba tradition. A chapter on the arts relates appreciation for art to the role of the emotions in human motivation and features critical comments on Cuban literature, with some sharp criticisms directed at the famous Afro-Cuban poet Nicolas Guillén. It should be clear by now why Betancourt deserves comparison with Du Bois. Du Bois, too, combines separatist and integrationist ideas in a nuanced fashion. Du Bois, too, uses the topics of how Black people are treated and what they ought to do about it to explore classic big questions in philosophy, like the meanings of religion and art. Admittedly, Betancourt's emphasis on Black economic success and self-sufficiency may strike some as more reminiscent of Du Bois's rival, Booker T. Washington, 
It's worth considering, though, that his emphasis on the value of cooperation might be compared, perhaps even more appropriately, to the kind of arguments for Black economic self-organization that Du Bois began to make in the 1930s, which led to his temporary break with the NAACP. Comparing Betancourt and Du Bois returns us to the question of their diverging attitudes towards communism. If the Du Bois of 1961 really did read Betancourt's article, Castro and the Cuban Negro, he would probably have viewed that article's anti-communist dimension as a significant flaw. To understand what is going on in that article, however, we should first consider one more dimension of Betancourt's El Negro, namely the view taken in that book of Fidel Castro. When that book was published, Cuba's government and political system were not yet avowedly communist. Indeed, it was not until 1965 that the party led by Castro renamed itself the Communist Party of Cuba. By the time Betancourt's article was published in May of 1961, it was clear where things were heading. But it was not until December of that year that Castro publicly declared himself a Marxist-Leninist. We're not sure in which month of 1959 Betancourt published El Negro, but it was clearly after March of that year, when Castro also made an important public declaration. He acknowledged prejudice and discrimination against Black people as major problems and announced his government's intention to do battle against them, which may seem like the least he could do, having been exposed to Betancourt's perspective, but we shouldn't underestimate what a big deal this was in a country where it had been much more common for those in leadership to deny that Cuba had any racial problem. The final two questions of the very last homework set in the book give some indication of how Betancourt viewed this development. The first question is, can the revolution that succeeded on the 1st of January of 1959 get rid of racial discrimination by itself? And the second question is, can the declarations of Dr. Fidel Castro against racial discrimination bring this social blight to an end? Both questions are answered with a no. To the second answer, Betancourt adds, the declarations of Dr. Fidel Castro against racial discrimination cannot by themselves bring racial discrimination to an end. Their benefit is limited to noticeably reducing the fear that is endemic in the Black subconsciousness, which will allow the movement to work with greater results. So, as we said, at the time of El Negro, Betancourt was cautiously optimistic about Castro's rule, but with as much emphasis on the caution as on the optimism. As with past revolutionary change, such as that which resulted in Cuba's independence from Spain, Betancourt thought the revolution that culminated in 1959 could easily be mistaken for more than it was. Nothing but black self-organization could bring about the end of racial discrimination. Still, Castro's anti-racist pronouncements helped create an atmosphere in which ultimate success may be possible, and this was much better than nothing. In Betancourt's piece in The Crisis, which remains the only work of his that is easily accessible in English, Betancourt explains what happened next from his point of view. He took his task as Secretary General of the National Federation of Black Societies to be the reorganization of provincial federations and preparation for a national convention. But to his frustration, communists attacked his authority, threatened to show up armed to the national convention, protested his plans to exclude them in response, and in various other ways stood as obstacles in the way of the Federation's success. Shortly after a seemingly routine meeting with Castro, Betancourt was surprised to hear, through news media, that he had resigned his post. Castro had, at this point, still not publicly identified himself as a communist. Nevertheless, his policies and his appointment of communist ministers told the tale. As an example of how Betancourt takes the behavior of communists in Cuba to be indicative of their danger more generally, he explains the conflict that led to his removal in this way. Since communist theory is that they are the proletariat and that class conflict has been eliminated, non-communist organizations are not needed. This dogma naturally brought the Negro organizations into collision with the government. By the time that he wrote Castro and the Cuban Negro, Betancourt was living in exile in the United States. From this vantage point, he mourned the destruction of the organizational capacity that he'd been trying to build and which he had upheld as the means to overcoming racism. The local societies, which had sometimes depended on government for funding, now found themselves in the reverse situation. They were made to hold public dances and turn over the proceeds to the government for projects like agrarian reform, industrialization, and the purchase of weapons and planes. 
provincial federations and a national federation disappeared, while plenty of local societies shut their doors, with many others close to death. Betancourt solemnly concluded, One can truthfully say, and this is without the slightest exaggeration, that the Negro movement in Cuba died at the hands of Senor Fidel Castro. It is telling, however, that Betancourt made his home in the United States in New York rather than in Florida, where those who fled Castro's rule were, and still are, most concentrated. In keeping with the viewpoint he held all along, Betancourt distanced himself from most organized efforts to oppose Castro in exile, writing, All are controlled by white Cubans who have refused to accept Castro's pattern of subhuman living, yet they do not exhibit the slightest interest in the fate of the Cuban Negro. They seem not to care that he lived a miserable and unhappy life before Castro, and that he is continuing to live the same way under Castro. Nor do they seem worried that Cuban Negroes may continue to live as pariahs even after Castro has gone, even though the future government might be a so-called democratic government. Betancourt thus remained at this point, and presumably until his death in 1976, a voice of protest unsatisfied with any framing of Cuban politics that did not center racial inequality as a persistent problem, one that nothing but race-conscious policies and black self-organization could overcome. Observant listeners may notice that this has been our first episode on the Spanish-speaking part of the Africana world, and only our second on Latin America, understood as the parts of the Americas colonized by the countries of the Iberian Peninsula. We will come back to Portuguese-speaking Brazil soon, but it is time for us to leave the Americas as a whole and return to the African continent. The last thinker we covered who was actually based in Africa was Leopold Senghor, but in episodes to come, we'll be looking at other major figures in the independence movements that swept across the African continent during the middle of the 20th century. Some of the figures we will meet have been mentioned in passing a number of times, like Kwame Nkrumah, the first leader of independent Ghana, and Franz Fanon, whose powerfully influential ideas about colonialism evolved in the context of the Algerian independence movement. But we'll be starting in Nigeria, where two political leaders, Nanamde Azikiwe and Obafemi Awolowo, articulated opposing ideas about the best political system for the post-colonial situation. If you know nothing about Nigerian history, then why not read up on it to get yourself ready? Taking a page from Betancourt's book, we will make that your homework assignment as you await the next episode of The History of Africana Philosophy. <music>